welcome to DexterCast, the podcast where we explore the different perspectives on the issues that matter. I am Amra Bess. And I am Merle Emrich. Today, we are your hosts and guides. So, I have a very special guest with us today. Would you please introduce yourself to us? Yeah. Hi, my name is Petra Ragnarstam. I am working at Malmö University. What I've been doing most actively recently is working with a new, relatively new master's program called Culture and Change. So a lot of my interests also in research has evolved from that program and the things we're doing together in that program. So um, a lot of new stuff, a lot of new interesting readings and things to think about in that program. So working at Culture School of Arts and Communication. And Malmö University. That sounds very interesting. Uh, I'm, I'm going to have an educated guess and I'm going to assume that you teach in a course called Representation and Power. Yes! <laughs> surprise, surprise! How did you know? <laughs> How did you know? Yeah. And in that course you introduce to your students onto politics and post-humanism. Yes. So when did you first come across both those topics? Yes, are you prepared? No. <laughs> Tell us the whole story. Oh, it's still is the whole story. Well, actually, in fact, I've been working a lot with questions about power, questions of understanding how, how people are becoming the kind of people they are and how we're actually understanding the world around us. I mean, I've always been extremely theoretical in my viewpoint with everything. I love theory because it makes you think, right? Uh, so, I mean, already at university and especially in my doing my PhD, I've been doing quite a lot of colonialism. The classic, actually, what you call in, in cultural studies, it's uh, class, sex and race, or what they're actually called originally. So I've been working quite a lot of those. And in, in doing theory of that, I've often been on a high level of theory, theory, right? Extremely experimental, extremely interesting, reading stuff like, uh, you don't, probably don't know them now, but Kristeva and uh, Irigaray, Siksu in gender studies. And then I moved on to people like um, Judith Butler and... In Marxist theory, I've been doing a lot of Althusser, I've been doing a lot of Frederick Jameson uh, in post-modernism, Baudrillard, Deleuze and Guattari, so Derrida, a lot of really sort of fantastic thinkers. So I think it sort of comes from already from that background, interested in these theories. Uh, on a sort of high level of thinking and trying to understand the world around us, but also thinking about the inequalities and why the world looks the way it, the way it is, right? Mm. So it comes sort of historically from that. And then working with the program, I started thinking more and more about Anthropocene, the world in a much more larger perspective, uh, the challenges we're facing. And then I started reading up on that. And then I realized when I started working with the program, representation and power, it's kind of a weird course because it could be anything, right? Yep. So it's not altogether set that it should be something like that. But for me, it was important to think further, push, since it is a master's program. Okay, you probably studied a lot of representation. You've come from some kind of a place where you're familiar with certain things. Let's see if we can push it a bit. Mm. So that's where I started reading up on, okay, where is, where is research now? If we're pushing things, where are we actually ending up now? So that's where I started reading more up on post-humanism, started working, and then I came along with onto politics, because I've always find it a bit disconcerting, this universalist idea about the world. And I've always find it extremely disconcerting, the extremely anthropocentric view of the world. Um, so it, sort of it's, for me, it's pushing those boundaries of thinking further than, we've, than the comfort zone even I am normally in. Mm. So that's practically it. And then 
you know how it is. You start reading something and then you stumble upon something and think, oh God, what is this? And then you start reading and then you come across and some of the people you know, Latour and people like that, but then you, you all of a sudden you find Anna Marie Moll and you think, oh God, what is this? Isn't this fresh and interesting? You know, isn't this interesting to deal with? So not a straight path. Okay. Following different trajectories, finding different... And then, of course, I have my background in representations. i always been quite a fanciful reader. I'm not really all that keen on social realism. <laughs> so also in the, the kinds of work I'm reading, watching, listening to, has already pushing those boundaries for me as well. We will actually return to pushing the boundaries uh, yeah. later on during this. Yeah. Uh, but for now, could you briefly introduce onto politics and post-humanism to our listeners? Oh, yeah, it's a very easy. Question. It's a very it's like easy question. Essence. So okay. Well, for me, okay. So let's start with the idea of difference. That we believe that everything is not the same. I mean, things are working quite differently in different places. Uh, and of course, traditionally, people like post-colonialist feminist theory, mostly, I think, have been pushing towards the understanding of certain kinds of differences and that that difference in itself is positive. I mean, that we should, that acceptance of that difference is something positive. And of course, that has been meant a lot for colonialist studies, right? Uh, looking at how certain things has had been silenced, certain things have not had a voice, um, and how they more or less are saying that that is de detrimental because the plurality of differences is actually a good thing, right? So then what ontopolitics is doing is pushing further from, let's say, not only saying like, okay, we're doing things differently culturally. You do this and I do that. Isn't that interesting? Or epistemologically that you think this way and we think this way. Isn't that quaint and nice? Or representations like, oh, you represent these things this way and we do it this way. Isn't that nice? We are different, right? Which I, I like that as well. I mean, I think that is equally important, right? But so what, the, what you start asking then is, okay, what if things are radically different, even more radically, because that's already quite radical, right? What if they're even more different? What if things are ontologically different? What if ontology is not something stable and fixed that we can just reach to in, in some kind of similarity, right? That ontology all of a sudden is just a, the same thing, it's stable, it's out there, it's same for everybody. Why have we presumed that when we have sort of, with post-colonialism, feminism, and also, let's say, Marxism, pushed difference in all other areas? Why have we stopped there? And of course, that has to do with a lot of universalist thinking that we need a stable out there that we can all have in common, sort of. And that also has to do with science and the, our belief in science to sort of have access to that reality in specific ways by doing things in certain ways you can sort of understand and have access to that reality whereas if you think about it it might actually be so that that universalism is actually pushing out other ontologies why why does science have the right explanatory rights to say that reality is one thing and reality is the same for everybody. And some of the people we've been reading in, in Representation of Power are suggesting that that is almost like the heaviest form of exorcism to push out, not only epistemologies, voices, representations, cultures, killing those, but also actually in doing that, you're also doing that to ontologies, the acceptance that maybe the world is plural and not just one thing and either you think that's completely crazy which is fine or you think like mm, wouldn't that be interesting you know you open your mind and you start thinking oh what would that mean for my living in this world if I would accept that notion and that's where I am now I don't have answers to this right I'm just thinking I'm at the point saying okay what, what would that mean 
for me living in this world if I started thinking like that? What would it mean for my coexistence with others if I started thinking like that? This is, of course, also then leads to post-humanism. I <laughs> forgot post-humanism. <laughs> Because, you know, then post-humanism is questioning what is the human in different ways. So what if the human is not the center of understanding of the world? What, what if the human is not the one to determine what is real and what is not real? What do we know what other things out there are worlding mm. in their way? Why is the human the center of all understanding? So post-humanism is also thinking the boundaries between, you know, what if the human is not the epicenter of the world? What if the human is, are not the only ones creating understandings? What if the human is not the only one worlding the world? And that means also then letting go of certain, certain, I don't know, visions, certain, I don't know, megalomania. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. No, I was just um, thinking about how more conventional or more conservative thinkers probably criticize those ideas saying that there might be the risk for relativism yep. and saying that okay but if that if you say that there are different realities then what stops climate denialism for instance um, and isn't that a dangerous path to go on because then I could argue for any reality some of which are perhaps not the realities that we want yeah. so within this framework of onto politics also post-humanism how would you cope with this risk or where do you draw a line and how do you identify which realities are realities and which realities are just something else yeah I think that's the, that is the sort of million dollar question right now. I, I, I completely agree. And that is a fine line to balance. And I don't have an answer to it. I just, I just feel like falling back on the idea that somebody has the exclusive right of explaining the world is perhaps not the right way or going about this any longer. I, I, I but, you know, I grew up um, with, let's say, post-structuralism, post-modernism, and they've been slashed since then for creating that kind of relativism. Uh, what can I say? Well, I don't think that post-modernism is the problem. I think their problem lies elsewhere. I think they're still explaining the world to us and why the simulacrum, let's say, the question is not relativizing it. It's trying to understand how can we have such tensions of understanding about reality. But I agree. I mean, for me, that is a stumbling block. And I, I'm not there. I can't give you an answer. The only thing I can think about that would, when I think about it, is that perhaps we're asking the wrong question. Why are the climate deniers claiming? What is, why, why, why do, what do they want to out of it? Is truth and false the only thing that is at stake here? Aren't there other, actually other dynamics involved? That's what I'm thinking. When people like Trump are claiming things as right, when we actually know, do you see what I mean? That, okay, but we have other people claiming other things here. Why is he claiming that? Do you see what I mean? I mean, this is not an innocent thing that is going on. All these people are not doing it innocently there are a lot of power for me there's a lot of power dynamics going on in all these all these struggles and fights over epistemology politics ontologies social realities do you see what i mean so for me i what i'm trying to figure out is that perhaps the tension is perhaps not around that, but somewhere else. And we haven't even started looking at that because it's easier to fall back on a common reality that we can all be in agreement about. But it's also easy then to forget that that common reality has created atrocities along the line that we then all of a sudden forget. Do you see what I mean? I mean, that understanding of reality exercised other epistemologies, let's say, 
well, they killed people, right, in the name of. But all of a sudden that is forgotten and we can stay happy with the idea of a common universal truth. When, for me, thinking historically, I can't go back. I can't go back into that belief. For me, it doesn't work because the exorcisms have been too harsh for me to say I can comfortably, you know, cuddle back into that that thinking again. I don't know if I sort of under- explained that to you. Uh, so, I mean, I don't have a clear answer, but I think going back to a universalist truth and one world and one understanding of that world, I don't think that is the way to go. Even though I do understand that relativism is not a way to go either. So it has to do with, God, now, we're, now I'm going to sound like a post-humanist. It has to understand, it has to do with understanding and recognizing others in a way that is different. Sorry, and I don't think a lot of the people who are claiming the truth and right about things in a sort of this downright, I don't know, I don't know, problematic way. I don't think that standpoint is innocent. I think it has an idea of who you are in the world and how you think of yourself together with others in that world. That is the bottom line more than false and truth. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes me think of... Um, <laughs> I remember this thing, I think it was John Law, uh, when you talked about um, that there are values other than... The goods. Truth and false. Yeah. yeah, the goods, like, is it... Like, something can be there not because it's true, but because... I know, because it's beautiful, or because it gives you power... Justice. Or justice, or... Exactly. Care. Yeah. Yeah, so I, that, I think... And that is a very post-humanist, I think, understanding of the world. And I think not everybody is there, but I, so I, that's where I land. It's more in other kinds of recognitions mm-hmm. than that, than perhaps the universal reality or something like that. So it's not just zeros and ones. No, exactly. I'm afraid. <laughs> I actually think, the more I think about it, a lot of, it's, it hasn't have to do, no, it doesn't have to do with zeros and ones. It has to do with people being afraid of thinking really complex things. Hmm. And, the com- and this has to do with the Anthropocene, I think, that reality is becoming increasingly complex. And if you enter into ontopolitics and if you enter into post-humanist thinking, <laughs> Anthropocen- uh, anthro- uh, Anthropocene thinking, it's not getting easier. And I think a lot of people who are looking for, they're looking for simple answers to really difficult questions. And that's where it ends up in zeros and ones rather than all these difficult trajectories and levels of difficulties of understanding and all of that, right? Mm. Mm. I think that's a kind of an interesting thought because that's basically what uh, Rosie Predotti says, right? That this complexity led up to a lot of fatigue. Yes. And then at some point she poses this question why do we think so much? Why don't we just do? Why don't we just get out there and yeah. well the realities we want to have, yeah. uh, so to say. And then earlier you said that you really like the theory and the thinking. Yeah. So how do you deal with that? And how do you think that those approaches fit within academia, which often is very theoretical, and then you have this idea which is more practical? Yeah. Or, well, let's say, like, well, as a starting point, I think thinking is a practice. <laughs> That's a good point. <laughs> yeah, good point. Yeah, but I mean, the, the, I mean, a lot of people divide thinking and doing, mm. theory and practice. Well, I think thinking is one practice among other practices. And I think they need to be, you know, holding hands really carefully when we tread the future, you know. So uh, I don't see them as binaries or opposites I think we need to think and do and I think they are really important together I think they're really important together Uh, I don't think we could just do I think we need to think about the things we do as well because otherwise we're going to fall into simple traps where you tend to again do well post-humanism tend to try to think beyond binaries and of course binary is the easiest way of thinking yeah so I think if we just do, because it's let's just do, because it feels like then you've got a simpler path, 
but maybe it's easier to fall into traps of convenience and traps of uh, the comfort of thinking simple thoughts rather than daring to think complex thoughts. But I don't, th- I don't want complex thinking to end up in paralysis and nobody dares to do anything either. Uh, so we, we got to find a way of doing different kinds of practices together. But I think a lot of people are doing that as well. You know, a lot of people working with their hands, working with other people, other things out there in the world. I mean, I think they often are also doing a lot of thinking. (laughs) So it's not an opposite in my world. But, you know, even when doing those practices, having a sort of an understanding. And I think, you know, if you make people think then you make do and people do you make think so uh, yeah so hand in hand yeah i yeah. think so and i think that is really really important so um, but i do think thinking is also in practice and i think it is important for other practices and the other way around right yeah. and again it's not a duality there are so many practices so um, there are so many when there are so many ways of thinking and there are so many so yeah I think we need more of many things than less of things. Okay, to complicate things <laughs> further, <laughs> how do we world the world? Practices. <laughs> but a myriad of practices. And this is where I can so easily connect, let's say, post humanist thinking with traditional butler, traditional Althusser. Uh, you know, um, it's not like we believe and therefore we kneel down and pray. It's also we kneel down and pray and therefore we believe. Do you see what I mean? Yeah. So um, there are so many practices that we do that the world, the world in specific ways. And that is the myriad. And that's where it becomes so hard, right? So one practice is, of course, thinking about the world in specific and my relation to others in the world in specific ways that sort of form the way I do other practices in the world but other practices also make me think about my relation to I mean Butler is such she's so good when it comes to practices and her performativity I mean that's practically what she's talking about right so by me wearing these clothes today makes me become a certain kind of person doing certain things in certain way and therefore I'm worlding the world in specific ways and it can be simple things like well you know cultural studies it can be the way I brush my teeth (laughs) it can be the way I dress it can be the way I interact with my children it can be the way I interact with my partner it can be the way I interact with my students it can be the way I get to work and you know all of a sudden you start thinking oh is she bicycling is she taking the car is she commuting with you know train and of course that is bloody important and we think a lot about that but it's also small things is what i'm trying to say so it's also the way i sleep in my bed (laughs) because that is welding the world in specific ways i mean imagine sleeping on a straw mat in the woods that's a very very different kind of world and that regenerates a very very different understanding of the world from just being with the world in specific ways. Do you see what I mean? So, of course, living in this sort of Western privileged life is also makes it very, very hard because it the things around me make me world this world in specific ways. And it's really hard to get out of. Mm. So I don't remember, you know, if you remember Raymond Williams. No, uh, what's Raymond his name? Carver. Raymond Carver. Yes. Yeah. See. So much water. <laughs> yeah, so much water so and much water. elephants, right? Yes. yes. So we're sort of almost like prisoners, even as Westerners, prisoners within this world that we worlded already. But all of a sudden, it's really hard to get out of it because you know we need a phone in order to work. I need a. Do you see what I need things to get around and I need things all of a sudden it's sort of built around me like a big thing and there's no way I can think of how to get out of it. Right. So I can't just say I'm just going to go out and live in the woods because it doesn't really help. Do you see what I mean? But that is worlding the world. I think that brings up two interesting points like one the universalism you already talked about that we live in this society where capitalism is 
the universal truth, for instance, or um, mm -hmm. human anthropocentrism is the universal truth. Yeah. And it's difficult to find a way out of that. And at the same time, there's so many alternatives already there, like, for instance, the deep growth movement or the yeah. Zapatista movement, and they all present yeah. different alternatives and other yeah. ways of engaging with the world. And then the other thing that you said, there are things around you that world this reality, which brings us to agency. And that's not only humans that are agents, but no. the things we use as resources or which we think we have control over that also have an influence on yeah. that. Which makes me think of Life of Pi. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, we're, we're welding the world, not as agents, soul agents in the world. We're, agent, we're welding the world with the world. Do you see what I mean? I mean, this is a very post-humanist way of thinking, right? We're welding the world with all the other things in the world, where, whether it's this building. So it doesn't have to be agents that are alive, even. <laughs> Do you see what I mean? In our traditional sense of being alive. So even things around us we are welding the world with those things because it makes us act and do things in specific ways some of it is i mean i'm just thinking about roads that their roads make me weld the world in specific ways and that we build roads it's extremely detrimental right but it still sort of really creates the world in specific ways and it's really hard to get out of that because this is the world I'm reliving in right now, right? So it's really hard to get away if, because it's so, I was going to swear, it's so bloody ma material. Do you see what I mean? And that is also the point with practices and the way that Althusser and Foucault and Judith Butler talk about these things is that, you know, all of these things are just extremely material. So it's not only in your head, it, it, it is actually becoming material. Well, I doubt that any of our audience are going to be below 13, so you can swear all you want. Yeah. <laughs> no, they, they would probably tire, you know, we have, then we have to talk about more fun things. Bingo. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, so you talked about theory and practice. Uh, I, I want to get into post-humanism and... What does post-humanism mean for academia, seeing as there is a lot of emphasis on experimenting and doing rather than theorizing? Yeah, but again, I think theorizing is also doing. See? So I think, I think academia matters in that sense. If you think about the thinkers I've just talked about, they have changed the way we also do things in the end, right? So I do think that theorizing these things matter. So I, even though academia is, I don't know, slightly small, <laughs> and in that sense, slightly unimportant, uh, but you know, that you push thinking in a way. And I do think that matters that some people start pushing thinking in certain ways. Like, you know, let's just say Butler and Foucault and people like that, they have managed to push thought in, in the specific ways. Marxism have pushed thought in certain ways, not to mention colonialism, post-colonialism, right? So, but at the same time, I think that practices matter in the same way. And I think that there is also not a fine, there is a porousness out to other practices you do outside academia. And of course, I hope the things we do this here in this little ivory tower is also brought out there somehow. Do you see what I mean? So it doesn't stay in here, that it also matters for how we interact with others out there in the end. And of course, that it spills over somehow. Uh, so it doesn't remain in this academic setting. But I mean, I'm slightly weird in that sense, but I mean, for me, it matters these days. I haven't started thinking about these things. I can't do things the same way. I mean, some of the things I can't do anything about, that I have to have a phone for my work. And But today I bicycled to work and I got something in my eye and I was like, oh, really annoyed. And I got to work and I looked and of course I had killed a fly with my eye. So, you know, that bloody encounter wasn't very nice, especially not for the fly. 
<laughs> but you see the mean? So all of a sudden I started thinking, not that, oh, how annoyed I was with this fly. I actually, this fly in its encounter with me died in my eye. <laughs> so, I mean, it, it, I mean, I can't, do you see what I mean? But it does mm. matter the way you think about things, the way you interact with others because of the way you think. But of course it also matters. That's why I love teaching is that I meet you guys and then, you know, we think together and then you continue thinking with others. You're thinking with somewhere else. Not because you go killing flies every time you cycle? Yeah. <laughs> you know, that was a tragic incident, mm. you know. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> I think we talked about that before. Um, the, in uh, Robin Wall Kimmerer's book, uh, is she... The, not the one about moss, the other one. Seagrass. Uh, no, sweetgrass. Uh, sweetgrass, yes. Sweetgrass, exactly, yeah. Exactly, that was it. Braiding sweetgrass. Uh, yes. Uh, she mentions a colleague of hers, I think, he said that she doesn't refer to like bugs that get stuck in her hair, for instance, as something's in my hair anymore, no. but someone's in my yeah, hair. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That just changes how you think about the world, engage with the world. Yeah, but I mean, if you think about it, the way you, you, you the way you think about other people in the world, I, I suppose, having studied for some time, has changed, and how you think about those peoples, and how you cannot take the sort of a Western worldview for granted, and Western hierarchy and power that has become extremely problematic to think about these days. Whereas that was just okay. <laughs> Not very long ago, right? So, I mean, this is what I mean. It's other boundaries perhaps now we need to push. If you, if you take the Anthropocene seriously, if you do, then of course you have to push other things as well now. Uh, not to say that it lessens, I mean, it's becoming more and more complicated because the issues of power and West and the rest uh, is even more aggravating. So we need to remember that. And then we have to remember all the other things as well. So, uh, but do you see what I mean? So, I mean, some of the things have already become extremely problematic to take for granted, that were for granted a couple of hundred years ago. And all of a sudden it's becoming not possible anymore. And those are the kinds of things we need to push further, I think. And that you can do with post-humanist thinking. That's the, the, that is my connection to post-humanist thinking, is that taking the, the post-colonial, the feminist, the Marxist thought even further or into a different area and started thinking about them in, in a, where, where human is not either the center of everything. And how that mat matters for how we world the world then. Let's say. <laughs> so in a way, we are redefining the norm. Yeah, the frames, uh, Ala Butler, her frames, right? So, mm. what is included in those frames? What are those norms actually? What is what is ex included and what is excluded? And how does that matter for the lives we're living and the world we're producing? And that is, of course, another thing is, of course, the idea with the performativity and you're saying welding here is that also the world is something not stable out there already existing is something we produce all the time together. So that is another big thing for post-humanist thinking. Mm. Mm. So we actually want to talk a little about life of Pi. Mm. Yes. <laughs> We had to. <laughs> you, yeah. Um, yeah. Just because. So yeah. Yeah. I think I'm not sure if I like the book that no. much as a book, but no. I think it was a really great example to think about the whole processes of onto politics and yeah, um, and welding and the whole idea of negotiating existence. So maybe we with a tiger. With the tiger, <laughs> Richard Parker. Spoiler alert. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. um, so maybe we could use that story as some kind of example to yeah. make what we talked about a bit more concrete. Yeah, I mean, 
if we oh god spoiler alert are we allowed to do that here now but yes. i mean at we the, said spoiler alert. yeah at the very end right yes it's put to its very very point where pi when he's interrogated by the japanese agents for the company who owned the boat the ship where he says oh where it comes to which story do you believe is it is it the story about humans uh it's a horrible st- story about humans or is it a story about humans and animals right and i think that is for me the quint- i mean we've read a whole bloody book about humans and animals and then well we don't believe that story and then he invents in what is it a couple of pages this other story which is a realist story with humans <laughs> at the center, a truly human story, horrible human story, but we are feeling so much comfortable, even in its horridness with that story, than thinking about that it is a story of cohabiting and living and negotiating the world with other creatures. And that for me is almost, that's why I love that story, is that, that and, of, and I had a colleague who said, well, of, of course, it's the human story. The other one is just made up in order to psycholog- you know, psychologically make up for the horridness of the other story. And I say I completely disagreed and she was completely baffled. You know, so it's kind of interesting that why, why is that so much more believable? Well, because the humans are at center. We're really happy with this realist worldview. We're happy with how that story tells itself. The other story is unbelievable. It's fantastic. It's telling stories of humans and other animals in a way that we don't, we we recognize it as fiction. And there are funny other little animals, right? I can't even remember what they were called. I can't remember. You remember all that? I just remember that, the island. That island with the yeah. little... Oh, meerkats. Oh, yes. Weren't they mere... Oh, that, I love the idea of meerkats. <laughs> but then for, I mean, do you see for me? For me, it's opening the door for possibilities. Or you're closing the door and then you're accepting that other horrible little story, right? So the onto politics of that story would be the possible possibility of other realities and accepting things as real that we won't normally see as real. And why do we always fall back so easily upon the reality where we're feeling so happy and so comfortable, right? And the post-humanist part of this story is, of course, telling a story of cohabiting and living with other critters and, and accepting that cohabitation with others which is then also a mere fiction. And I I think this is extremely interesting because, of course, if you look at the history of the novel, it grew with industrialism. It actually became what it is with industrialism and the way of thinking with industrialism. And you can imagine 18th century up to today and how that has formed the problematic thinking which has produced the Anthropocene, which we are now in. So the novel is really problematic. What kind of stories can a novel say if it grew up with industrialism and, and that kind of thinking with, the, with, the, um, uh, with that kind of rationalism, uh, progress, all of these things that cam- came with uh, industrialism has also formed the novel. So I'm also appreciating novels that trying to push the boundaries of that comf- comfortable, but also important. I'm not I'm not discrediting realism because I also recognize the importance and good good things in realist novels. But we also need other kinds of stories. So my point is also imagination. I think. We need to imagine differently. So I think those kinds of stories can help us do that. Uh, and all kinds of stories, not only novels. Maybe we need to blow you know, the borders around that novel as well. So we need comics, we need films, we need TV series, we need, I don't know. I've entered into this space where I do so much handicraft. I'm not very good at it, but I love it. So maybe we need to knit and 
So, and do you see what I mean? All these other practices to create imagination is for me really, really important. And if some novels can sort of put the finger on that kind of importance, which I think Life of Pi does, especially with that ending, it's actually it's pointing. Move. Yeah, I mean, it's just pointing towards it, right? So I think that is, but that's also why I really think it's important to read magic realism and understand where that come from. It's important to read all these cli-fi and all these future novels because we need to imagine the future differently as well. So we need, and films and whatnot, right? But we need to imagine, we need to dare to imagine differently uh, with different practices. And, you know, I sort of forced you to read Life of Pi. <laughs> No, but it was a good choice, I think. Yeah. I don't like the way it was written, but uh, I think I learned something from it. Yeah. So I, took, I took something good from it. Yeah. And you continued your imaginative journey from there, right? So, um... I think the most striking thing in that story to me was this conversation where you told me about your colleague yeah. and how you prefer the imaginative story. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, I think that's... I, I, I was going to say that's where I think I think differently from people who are also, I mean, we're all born and raised with certain kinds of story. That's my point, is that we're feeling very, very happy within those stories that confirm our own, I don't know, our own place in, in the world, in a way. I think that is, I think we're very, and I think a lot of stories are also formatted in a way that it's hard to get out of. I mean, if you think about the novel form or stories generally, linearity. Who says? Not even physicists say that we are linearities. Do you see what I mean? So we're really happy with stories that are following certain trajectory, you know, a certain line of thought, that way of telling a story where you have a, an ending and where you feel like you reach some kind of an understanding of things, and that makes us feel, I don't know good in ourselves you know and that might also be problematic because that also invites you and of course an effect is another one you know first this happened and because of that this happened what if you get a story that is not giving you that what kind of story would you get then well, i'm getting ideas now <laughs> yeah what if you did a post-humanist story which is also embracing let's say actor network theory the idea that you have different trajectories and you can't you can't put a simple cause and effect to things which would be anthrop anthropocene understanding of the world right what in the world would that story look like and i don't think we're there yet in story wise i'm also teaching imagining catastrophes another course where i teach then let's say catastrophe stories <laughs> And where we do specifically catastrophe films. And there is, I think, catastrophe films is the most simple story in the world. It's, it's just telling the most simple story. And they're telling it the same way over and over again. That is somewhere, if we're thinking of catastrophe movies, where there is a lot of thinking about the future catastrophes. We can't follow that simple trajectory because it will not allow us to think differently about the future. Do you see what I mean? Mm. So I think catastrophe films are highly problematic in, in imagination because they're following a too simple storyline. Have you seen Don't Look Up? Yes. <laughs> yes. I mean, it's playing, but it's still following quite yeah. a simple trajectory. But I mean, a lot of them are playing and we're getting there. You know, there you have... Uh, we have these stories, we have the potentiality, we have a problem with capitalism of, of being able to tell those stories and getting the stories out there. But they're still there, you know, you just have to find them and see them. Or, or tell them yourselves, come on. We're good, taller storytellers, right? You can tell a different story. That's what I think we, that's the practice, is that we can't only leave them to certain people to tell those stories. We have to do it ourselves in different ways. In the upcoming episodes of Beyond Human, we will continue to explore post-humanism and ontopolitics. We will look into how these theories can be applied to literature, film and video games. Next time, we will talk about Zoe Gilbert's novel Mischief Act.